You can hear the sounds of the underground rage You know it feels like this thing at approximately 2 a.m. where they discovered the body of an infant. The suspect supposedly became enraged about the true identity of the child's father and shot the victim in cold blood. I am confident that the district attorney will handle this case appropriately and push for the death penalty. Are there any questions? You, sir. I'm sorry, I can't answer that right now. You, ma'am! No, no, that's a stupid one. You, sir! Look, no further questions, no further questions, no further questions. Paul Sylvain, I can almost hear them breathing. If I listen, then I hear my own heart beating. Paul Sylvain, I can almost hear them breathing. If I listen, then Welcome, everyone. Go ahead, Dupunker. Hello. Good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone from all over the country and some different parts of the world, too. We are so excited and so, so excited. And 
So my name is Dipankar Mukherjee. I'm one of the artistic directors of Pangea World Theatre. And on behalf of Art to Action, uh, Andrea Asaf, um, Meena Natrajan, Pangea World Theatre, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you for this amazing, sacred, powerful gathering of some really cool people. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but before we begin and uh, journey together uh, with uh, Linda Paris Bailey, whom you'll hear from, I would like to introduce you to uh, a ritual that we do in, uh, in Pangea. Uh, we call it the two minutes. Uh, so um, it, it will, be, I'll, uh, because we work with people from all over the world, the ritual has arrived at uh, ritual has been arrived at by the ensemble. Um, it's 25 years old, as long as Pangea has existed. Uh, what we do is we sit in a circle. So you have to imagine these squares that you are watching is actually a circle. You have to imagine that we are creative people. And right in the center is a lamp and we have this bell. And so I'm gonna ring a bell, ring it. And then we all just take a moment to breathe and all of us come into this room and then we just breathe together. And then after that in silence and after that I ring the bell again and we just call it two minutes. Um, that's all it is. Um, so it's well, just crossing the threshold to come into this space, breathe together and then after and the permission of all the elders, I would like to um, begin um, our two minutes of silence. Dipankar, I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself and ring the bell again. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Mina and the Pankar. That has been a um, practice that I've enjoyed very much working with you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Dipankar. Um, we're now going to give a little bit of introduction and framing to this session. And, uh, and then we'll begin with our esteemed directors roundtable. Um, Mina, would you like to tell us a little bit about the history of the Institute? Sure, thank you so much, um, Andrea. Um, so my name is Meena Natarajan and I'm one of the artistic directors. I'm the executive director of Pangea World Theater and I welcome everyone to this amazing place. I also just want to acknowledge that I am on Dakota land um, and I use uh, she, her pronouns. 
Um, I'm, I'm zooming in from Minneapolis. Um, so just welcome. It's so wonderful to have this amazing group of people over here. Um, and uh, the, this, this institute really began in 2012. And to be honest, it began way before that when we had our first uh, of a conversation at the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists, where we spoke about what, uh, so where, where Pangea convened a directing panel and a director's panel. And we found that there was so much traction about what was directing, how, like, what, you know, and, and the lack of people of color in um, as, as directors and women directors and uh, and also like a lack of um, ensemble based processes and so we you know we went back and we raised money and we raised money for four years it took, took you know it takes people of color, color four years to raise funds for something like this and so in 2012 we finally um, had our pilot institute in 2012 and uh, invited all kinds of amazing people, including Linda Paris Bailey and many of you in this conversation. Um, and, uh, I, and we found that it was amazing because we had a, we did a little peer exchange in 2012 with directors, with ensemble creators and with alternate methodologies, you know, aesthetics that are from different places, um, aesthetics that like, from hip hop aesthetics to diasporic aesthetics, talked about what decolonization meant. That first uh, our National uh, Institute was electric. There was such a need and a hunger for that, that we knew that there was something there. And so what we then did was went back and again, raised some more money <laughs> and said that, you know, and, and uh, managed first. And then we also found that we, uh, one of the things that we found during this Institute was that we really wanted to create more space for um, uh, you know, my communities that were never represented before. And we, we, we went around, we went and searched for uh, directors from the indigenous communities. And so we had a little gathering of um, uh, 35 indigenous artists in March of 2015. So it took us another three years. And then in 2015, August, we launched our second peer exchange. And since then, we've been experimenting with the format for this institute. We've included the next generation. And from the next generation, we also realized that that, that method of teaching, uh, where it was from, uh, where, where it was like, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, um, uh, where, where it was uh, uh, hierarchical, where it was like teachers teaching students didn't work for us. So what we instead created in 2018 was a mentorship institute. So a National Institute for Theater Directors and mentees. And so mentors got to bring their mentees to this institute. And uh, we, we, we really you know, looked at that format and we found that it really worked for us to have that. And so in 2019, we did a mentorship institute once again. And we've been trying to refine this process of what it means to hand over our knowledge to the next generation, what it means to have a space of true solidarity where people from everywhere, from multiple places, including international directors, get to come. And what does it mean? What, what is this messy place of creating together, creating peer exchanges, uh, really exchanging methodologies? What does that mean for us? And how can we really serve the field so that uh, there are more directors that are being from, uh, there are more people of POC directors and more, um, uh, you know, uh, um, women directors that are out there directing, doing their work, and how can we build that intersectionality and solidarity with each other? And how do we include both non-Western, I mean, I don't like to use the word Eastern and Western, but how do we build both non-Western and Western methodologies? And how do we decolonize our practices in the way that really reflects who we are as a community and how we build that deep relationality with each other. So those are some of the intentions of the Institute. And that's some of the history of the Institute as well. Thank you, Mina, for that overview. And uh, thank you, Mina and DePunker and Pangea World Theater. Um, I'm Andrea Astaff. I'm the Artistic Director of Art to Action. And this whole uh, journey with Pangea World Theater uh, has been an incredible partnership since really uh, 2010, as Mina said, when we started investigating the creation of the Institute. And that brings us to today and all of you being here. And thank you so much for all the all of you who have joined. We have over a hundred people in the Zoom room with us tonight and more folks watching uh, live streamed on HowlRound and Facebook Live. Um, thank you all for being here for this very important conversation. Um, so tonight is auspicious for us for many reasons. One, because of the incredible 
a group of directors that you're going to hear from this evening. And um, secondly, because tonight this event actually launches the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creations online programming series um, that we're beginning this very evening together. And we'll be uh, convening folks in late November. We'll tell you more about that at the end of the evening. And then we'll be uh, offering monthly offerings, uh, including master classes as well as panel discussions in the new year. So we hope that you will um, join us not only for tonight's conversation, but this whole journey of all these amazing artists. It's great to see um, artists here who've been part of the Institute, artists who've been mentees, uh, artists who are just joining us for the first time tonight. We welcome all of you. And it is my great honor and pleasure always to introduce the wonderful, talented, extraordinary woman tour, playwright, uh, director, ensemble leader, dear friend and esteemed colleague, Linda Paris Bailey. Linda, I invite I you. Invited. To <laughs> you know, um, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Mina and DePunker. Um, the Institute has been so incredibly um, special and I think uh, stimulating in terms of um, our practice and the people that we gather with when we come to the Institute. And um, I'm talking about the people who are on this panel who are uh, amazing artists in their own right. You have Creative Capital awardees, you have Duke awardees, you have United States Artists awardees, and you have some of the most generous artists in the field. And that I think is uh, what is highly important to me. I'm gonna uh, start this session because this is a conversation and we're going to, you know, have talk to one another. But I want to start with this quote from Ralph Ellison because I think it's really appropriate. And it may be in or out of context, but I want you to use it as the basis for the conversation. It says, some people are your relatives, but others are your ancestors. And you choose the ones you want to have as ancestors. You create yourself out of those values. And I think this panel represents the values of our ancestors, the values that we share moving forward, uh, the definition of unapologetically Black directors. And I want to introduce them to you or actually have them introduce themselves to you. Um, I'm Linda Paris Bailey. And um, I have been an ensemble creator actor with the Carpetbag Theater uh, Emeritus for 45 years. And I'm now the playwright and CEO of Paris Bailey Arts. Um, I think that I'm going to ask everyone to consider and name, if you will, or acknowledge uh, on the panel some of the people, because if we were trying to name all of the people, we would be here each all night and we don't have that kind of time. So I would ask them to share just some of the memorable and sh shoulders that you stand upon as you come as um, fine artist in this field. So I'm going to um, open up the introductions with just one more quote. And then um, I think, Sharon, I'm gonna ask you to, to begin. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to begin because I'm going to use a quote from you to also stir the pot, if you will. Um, the beauty of art is simultaneity, multiple truths being allowed to exist. What would happen if the world could live with that? multiple truths existing. And I use that quote because we are five artists 
and we won't represent everyone's views. We know that, you know, black people have different views, but I think the, the idea that we share something about the higher mission of our work. And I think that's the, um, that's the, the core. And before I hand it over to Sharon, I will say that uh, there are so many uh, shoulders that I stand on, um, including, of course, um, going all the way back to Howard University and my experiences at Howard um, and the teachers that I had there and moving on to my experience at, at Highlander Center with Jane Sapp. And um, I think there are going to be so many, so many familiar names that I'm gonna stop. And I'm going to ask Sharon to speak. And I think she's unmuted already, are you? Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sharon Bridgeforth. Uh, I'm a writer and performing artist, uh, a self-employed touring artist since 1998. Um, I'm on Kids Land in Los Angeles right now. I use she, I use all the pronouns and really mermaid is my perfect fit for a pronoun. Um, and I'm so deeply grateful to be here and the depth of my gratitude, it will take a long time for me to express it. So I just wanna say thank you to each of you for all that you've done for me over the years. I feel like there's a way that I'm here because you all in various ways have helped me, have inspired me and have been there for me. Um, and I will name additionally, just that my family, I, you know, I'm still trying to tell stories as good as them. I will never be able to do that. But that simultaneity, it's making the gumbo, you know, it's like, we stir it, we stir in the roux, baby. Um, and I, I have to also say Lori Carlos's name. Thank you. I invite you to unmute, Linda. Stephen, would you like to share next? Yes, I shall. How's okay. everybody doing this evening or early afternoon, whatever it is, where you at, where you at? Um, my name is Stephen Sapp, um, he, him, his. I am a poet, playwright, director, writer, dancer, whatever. Um, I have, um, I stand on the shoulders of my family, first and foremost. Um, to me, they are the foundation. They are that, you know, that beat to you, that hit to your hop. You know what I mean? The family is, 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 the, is the bottom for me. Um, and then the Bronx, uh, born and raised, proudly say it from the Bronx, South Bronx, um, born and raised. So that upbringing, those folks, those people, that upbringing is a strong, foundation for me just to even start as a human being on the planet um, and where I learned how to do art and community activism and all the stuff that I do do now it all starts from there um, Amiri Baraka uh, the last poets Sonia Sanchez Sandra Maria Estevez um, the New Eureka Poets Cafe I stand on those shoulders the Black Panthers and the Young Lords um, I stand on those shoulders and to be honest with you for the folks that are in the Zoom room um, folks I know I mean, I've, I've gotten to know over the years um, who have talked to me or we've had a conversation on the side where you didn't even know that that was a conversation I needed at that moment um, and held me up um, at a moment where you didn't know it. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for everybody on this panel. And um, I pass it back to Linda. Thank you, Stephen. Let's go to Stephanie next. Stephanie? Hey there. Um, my name is Stephanie McKee Anderson. Uh, she, her, my pronouns. Um, hmm. I am an artist, a creator, a strategist, um, director. I wash windows. I do all of those things. Um, wow. I think the thing that's coming up for me when I think about the shoulders that I stand on, I think about being a public school student and coming up and right now there's a teacher's name, Jolene Jeff is coming into the room for me who um, understood 
uh, my need to move and was very supportive of me on the inside of that. Now that's besides, again, I have storytellers in my family as well. My grandfather, um, uh, DK Cooley, Dorothy Cooley, um, the obvious, John O'Neill, I stand on those shoulders of John O'Neill and Doris Derby, um, of alternate roots, um, of HBCUs and marching bands, uh, of Carol B. Bell, of John Willa, Willa Jo Zoller and Steve Kent, just to name a few. Besides all of the people that are here um, that, you know, I got a nickel, you got a nickel, together we have 10 cents and we make something out of it. Um, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, to be a part of a network, a growing network of people that um, we find each other and we're drawn to each other. Thank you, Stephanie. Lou, you get to bring it in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Lou Bellamy. Uh, I'm speaking with you from Minnetonka, Minnesota. That's uh, Dakota and Ojibwe land. Um, I uh, am founder and artistic director emeritus of Penumbra Theater Company, which is uh, 44 years old. Um, I was trained by Horace Bond out of uh, Louisville. Horace went to IU and uh, came here to teach at the University of Minnesota. And uh, was, he was very influential for me. Um, I was raised by women, strong, strong, strong women. And uh, uh, it, it gave me a particular perspective on life that uh, I, I'm really happy to have. I came to artistic maturity doing the work of August Wilson. Um, uh, but I've, I've been fortunate to have had in my life always uh, what I guess I would call an adult, but someone who would recognize something in me that I didn't see in myself. And, and say, boy, you got some meat on your head. Why are you acting such a fool? Come on over here and walk on this way, you know? And uh, I've been just so very fortunate that those people have come into my life at just the right time uh, to make such a difference for me. And I try to pass that on. I've been a teacher for 50 years. Uh, a student for longer. So I'm trying my best to right now um, show people ways of doing this work. Uh, you can talk about the work, but it's meant to be given breath. And so I travel almost in a, a missionary spirit, trying to show them how to do the work there. So Lou, um, you just you just rolled me into the first question that, that I'm <laughs> going to ask you. <laughs> you know, it's, it was a perfect segue. Um, you know, you were quoted in our conversation as saying people look for art to lead. And you referenced the statement that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So what is the historical evidence that these statements are true? And what do black directors do to keep the needle moving forward? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that, well, I know that it starts with your history. And that's why one of the, the primary symbols that we use at Penumbra is the Sankofa bird because you've got to know where you've been in order to know where you're going. Um, it all starts with black writers. Without them writing these words, we have nothing to, to build on. So I, I'd say it starts with uh, black writers and they have been in my study of black intellectual thought 
very seldom frivolous with their time, their ink, or their effort. From David Walker's appeal in 18, what, 29, to the oldest extant black play, William Wells Brown's Escape or A Leap to Freedom, that wasn't even produced during his lifetime, that was read at abolitionist meetings. Black writers have always addressed issues. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be funny and that you can't have fun and you can't be entertaining, but I, I see a, uh, 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 an attention to the condition of African Americans, and I can point to it as it built through the years. You know, when I introduced myself, I forgot to talk about one of the main influencers of the work that I still do today, and that's Larry Neal's essay on the Black Arts Movement. That grounds me. Those tenets keep me on the straight and narrow. All I got to do is look at them and it, they bounce me right back into where I should be. I, I, I view black directors as cultural purveyors, sort of. Um, now I am a, uh, a freelance director and I direct at major, large, white, institutions. And so I view myself as sort of a protector of that culture. I bring it in there and say, no, we're not going to put her hand on her hip. No, we're not going to do that. Um, those kinds of, of, of things that, that I know to be part of who we are, because I live I, I don't know the difference between my life and my art anymore. That, that's as simple as I can make it. It doesn't pick up one place and go to the next. It's all part of the same thing. When I was teaching directing, I would, at least they paid me to teach directing. Um, I don't know that I could teach directing. And I admitted that to my students. I don't know if I can do this. There's... I, but if you follow me around, I think you may learn something. And fortunately, they, they followed me, a few of them. And some of them have done very well. Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know where we are on time, but... Um, Doing great, there, Linda. Okay. Is there anyone else on the panel that would like to speak to Lou's statement or the question? in terms of you know, what, what is the, the evidence. And I think um, certainly in my experience, you know, uh, that, that black artists tell black stories, uh, black directors you know, direct black stories. And that doesn't mean that the director has only or exclusively to work with our stories or community, but it means that there is an intention you know, um, and that that we are talking to a particular community, um, and I think Stephen, you you talked about that. You you want to chime in? Yeah, I think it's um it's important. I I really take it to heart when um when folks of color come to a theater to see work, whether it's directed, whether it's a a, a play of color or, or not that I'm directing or with my company universes we're coming to a place i want them to feel like when they look at us on stage and when they interact with us it's the real thing it's the real deal um so they hear their culture for real there's there's certain things that we know that we feel that is authentically us i can say black poc whatever however you want to lump it that's authentically us we really make sure that that's in there and then after the show or even before the show, when you see folk and how you interact with them, if you were interacting with them in the street somewhere, it's the same type of respect. It's the same type of, um, if, if people are waiting after a show for you, you stay and you talk with everybody until you can't talk to anybody anymore. Because if they waited for you to stay, to talk to you, it's your responsibility to me as a black man, as a black director, all that, to stand and have that conversation to engage that way. 
um, that's our responsibility. That's how we were raised. Hopefully that's how you were raised um, and to interact. So when Lou says you can't tell the difference between your art and life, it's all the same thing. So how I walk with my life and how I interact with people are the exact same way I try to approach theater. And I am very much aware that I am a black man. Every time you walk into a space, I am very much aware of that. So because of that, then I know that there's a certain way I have to walk, move, operate. There's a certain way, you, you know, and when I say a certain way, you gotta move with purpose and with brains. And I've been saying this for a while, it is chess, not checkers. So you really gotta figure out how are you moving, how you're interacting, especially with our folk. You know what I mean? You, again, I really want them to go like, okay, yeah, that's, that's real, they're speaking for us. Um, so in the bigger sense of the word, when reviews come in, and, and don't get me wrong, we all like reviews and, and great reviews and to feel nice and, and to rub your back and it helps you get the next gig. But in reality, um, if, and, and I'm not saying this to be corny, but sometimes you'll walk off the stage or you'll look and you'll see somebody and they'll catch your eye and you see them and you know they got it and you know they felt it. There's no review really that can touch that moment, that moment of real human interaction. So, and the way to move through theater all these years is looking for that look, looking for that feeling. And I wanted to, uh, to Lou, that invitation for your students to follow you is so precious. That is sacred. And it's something that uh, we need much more of. I feel like it's something that I had a lot of a lot of, like I call it getting in the car. Like I just get get in the car, drive Lori to the Whole Foods. You know what I mean? <laughs> just sit there, follow y'all around, learn through being present and through serving. Learn through understanding what's in the silence. But that invitation to follow you around is everything. And so thank you for offering that and for saying it now. And, and I think part of what us collectively need to do is make more opportunities for that and support our elders as they are doing that labor. There's a generosity there you know, that we, I feel like sometimes we've gotten out of that place of that being generous um, and opening things up. You know, we feel like things are so precious sometimes, like we have to guard it all. And, um, and we've lost sight of what it means to really, again, what that gift is to allow somebody in um, is, you know, we can't have enough of that. Um, in this moment, I certainly hope that I try to continue to do that because it was done for me. Um, and it has, it has actually really kind of helped to form the work that I do and how I move in the world now is because of that. So it's a giving, a continuous, it's generational. Um, if I do it right, hopefully it will be generational. And, and it's intentional. I, I shared, I think, a story about uh, me being at Howard and, and being in a class, a writing class with John Oliver Killens and um, him inviting us, his students, to his home where his wife served us food because we were hungry students. But it was, you know, it was a, a reception at the home and it was a place where we could sit and talk and have intellectual discussions. And I think the need for that, and I think we've all experienced this, and, and that generosity is a part of, I think, the, the legacy of Black directors. So um, Sharon, you just, yes. you just opened up uh, another question. Um, and I'm gonna move us around a little bit, but um, so, you know, people are saying now, right, in 2020, um, 2019, that like, this is our moment, you know? Um, and I wonder if that's true. And if that's true, well, what do we do with this moment? And um, how do black directors fare in, in various spaces and in, in, in intersectional spaces? Um, what, what, 
what do you think we ought to be doing in this moment? I think supporting each other. So for instance, everyone on this panel has founded, is running an institution, is serving the community, support them, support those institutions, money, time, pass on the word, show up for things, um, support what is existing is a great opportunity. I think also this is an, an, a powerful opportunity to peel away what Toni Morrison calls the white gaze from our work, peel it away. We are shapeshifters. And so shapeshifting is something that is uh, part of our magic, but making ourselves small, trying to make ourselves understood trying to fit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let that shit go. Unpeel that white gaze from your work and from how we are with each other and from what our definitions of success are and make our own shit. They need us. So I think there is, that means that there is a lot of healing to be done mm -hmm. and we can help each other do that. I think searching for ways to love more, searching for ways to be present with each other more, searching for ways to tell the truth more deeply, searching for ways to expand what we even mean when we say black, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Let's include the diaspora. Let's talk about the continent. Let's look at class. Let's talk about, you know, genders and sexuality. Like let's tell the truth and figure out how to love each other in the process in our own way. And I think naturally, organically, what that does is it makes spaces for our audiences to come because we will truly be reflecting them more. Mm -hmm. It, I think, organically makes this moment, which is a, a, a powerful moment, something that could be systemically sustainable and thriving and not just passing in the wind. Uh, and I think it helps us to stand in with authority the brilliance that is our inheritance. And so I think there's a lot of information that we, that is part of our blood memory, that is part of our familiar practices, that is part of our natural impulses. And a lot of those things get shut down because we've made ourselves small a lot of times trying to survive. Mm -hmm. That ain't shape shifting. Shape shift, God damn it. <laughs> That's what I got to say right now. I'm keeping that one, Sharon. Shape shift, God damn it. <laughs> Um, uh, it, come on now, panel. Let's 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 stir this one around. Let's stir the pot. Well, you you know, go ahead, Stephen. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I really feel like um, this moment that we're in. Um, there are always moments that we're in. Um, the wheel has been invented before. You know, it's like and it's rolling. So. This time that you're in is, yes, there's institutions that are, the doors are opening and people are getting hired and things. And that's a beautiful thing. Also though, we don't necessarily need to function and move within those institutions. Um, in the same way we're trying to get in those institutions. For example, um, for universes, my company has been together 25 years. We have managed to all these years, we, we deal with um, regional theaters, community spaces, college space. We move around all over the place. We don't completely give our, so, ourselves over to any institution. We work in partnership with. Um, and I had an artistic director once jokingly said, you know, when we have conversations, and he's like, you know, you're a hustler. And at first, the first time I heard that, I was like kind of insulted. And like, what do you mean hustler? And then when we would have our, we would talk and we became friends, I began to understand what he considered hustling as being a hustler as what we do naturally anyway. 
how we move around and shape shift shape shift in, in spaces and how I'm going to deal with you for this amount of time and you for this amount of time and you for this amount of time. So yes, it's a beautiful thing that these institutions are now opening, but I'm going to keep it all the way funky. Um, for those of us who deal with regional theaters, you know, you're dealing with the board. So if the boards don't change, you're still going to keep running into a brick wall. So know mm -hmm. that when you're walking into that room, but also know that we can have and move in our own way. We're smart. We're really, just in terms of, think about all your friends and who you know and who can do what where. You know what I mean? You can move around outside of the system, outside of the box, so to speak, and not get caught up in the box. And that will keep your work liberated. And yeah, some things do better than others, but this will keep you free and liberated to do exactly what you think you want to do. And if you're really, really about it, to really kind of do that work. You know what I mean? Like, there's one thing to be able to get produced somewhere and you and we all understand you get produced somewhere. Once your show closes, it's over. So how are you going to continue to move around and continue to work and not necessarily be reliant on institutions to keep moving you forward? Lou, you want to come in? May I? Yeah. Uh, I, I, just I, I totally agree with just all of it. Uh, I, and I, I like the insouciance of it. You know, it's, uh, it's just it, that standing up, it's a good thing. Um, I, I think that, that institutions, I, I would like to, to trouble that a little bit with you, Stephen, and, and talk about what kind of institutions. Because like right now, I'm working in the major regional, you know, that, that, that sort of circuit. But I know that black institutions are the ones that house and keep my art, my culture and so forth. So we've got to make sure that they're strong because we'll go, we, you know, I'm 76 years old. I'm on the other side of that stuff, you know. So fortunately, I've, I hope left an institution that'll continue that, that sort of work. Um, integration destroyed black institutions. Look, all we look at historically black colleges, you know, we look at many of these things that, that we developed to take care of ourselves, sort of one way with, with integration. So I think that we've got that special need to keep these institutions healthy because they're not going to push you to homogenize the work, to, to pull it up, pull it apart. We're going for the center. We're trying to be black as we can be with this work. And they're trying to say, no, let's make this available for every, you know what I mean? So those institutions are where we can go to, to uh, preserve and, and get as deep into that as we can. Well, to, to come back, I, I really think that those, when we're talking about institutions of color, yes, of course, we need to support and be there for them um, and, and to be there for them first. You know what I mean? If you go to a city and you get two calls and one is from the big institution or this, and you get a call from over here, what call do you take? You know what I mean? And to really take it seriously. Like for me, it's like, well, there's this much money and there's this much money. We could figure this money out. You know what I mean? Like, all right, it's this, but you know, feed us, um, you know, cook us a meal after a show. Like is, there's different ways of making that work. When I'm speaking about institutions, I'm talking about, you know, obviously the major white institutions that we are trying to get our work in and that we're trying to get artistically validated for being there. So if you're at certain places and you do a work and then all of a sudden you're validated because you did X, Y, or Z, um, that's a beautiful thing. But again, I, I like, you know, you, you, as, as far as institutions are concerned, you, and I mean, and talk about predominantly white institutions, if you're dealing with them, you deal with them as much as you want to or, or, or can, or when you're sort of the hot button at the moment, and we know that happens too, you'll be hot for a year or two or three, and then things shift. How do you continue to work, continue, and then having a company, keep that company fed and to move around. And for us, we found ways where if we're not gonna do a regional theater, a community organization can call us, yeah, we can't do all the bells and whistles, give us five microphones, and turn them on and you'll get the same show that the, the, the big institutions would have got. And we always make sure for ourselves, we're doing the exact same show 
Um, so in, in that regard, keep yourself fluid, being able to, to understand what it means to be inside of a big institution and being able to produce yourself on your own and move around in, in both circles. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add? <laughs> I'm over here in Amen Corner because we would be one of those small institutions. Junebug would be the institution. I remember, uh, Steve, one time there was a moment we had a conversation about um, party people, I think, and about how it was wonderful production. And you were like, we did all the bells and whistles with it. And now it's so expensive that we, we're finding people to pick it up. And then on another note, it was people that were brave enough to take on the subject matter of it. I'm like, well, subject matter, like we're not afraid of that. <laughs> we're not afraid of that. The price tag is another story. But speaking as one of those organizations, I think that that has been the beauty of what it means to be in community, right? Is that we are able to understand the ebbs and flows of money and we're able to uh, work things out with, you know, it's the thing that you feel is heart centered and it's important and it's my people and I wanna support them and we figure it out. Junebug is a product of many ebbs and flows inside the economy. And we're still here because we've had people to be very generous. You know, we're still here that in times when things were good, we were able to be generous. Um, and I can't state that enough. Like if we have to figure out ways. There are times when there have been people who are powerful enough that they can drop your name inside of a room and you don't even know that there's an award that you're getting because somebody else dropped your name inside of a room. Mm -hmm. That is the power that folks have. And that has happened uh, to both Junebug and for me, not for nothing, it has been a bunch of powerful black women in philanthropy that are responsible um, for getting, helping us to get ourselves, dig ourselves out of a hole. Bunch of black women in philanthropy, surprise, surprise. Um, so, you know, I, I am exactly that product um, from that type of generosity. And it's something that you know, it's not new to us, right? This is the thing that is, um, you know, there is the stuff that you are, you're training and how you're taught and then all of the, all of that work. And then there's the stuff that is just your mother tongue. And so it, it would be, I think, reductive to just say that we're resourceful people, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's reductive, that it's so much more than that, right? This is a, an intricate, network of organizations, individuals, people that have figured out mechanisms that help us survive as one living, breathing entity, right? And if we continue to do that, that is, re that is what resilience looks like. Mm -hmm. But we also show up and we resist inside of these spaces. So I don't, don't wanna just say it is resilience. It is also resistance very strategically inside of these spaces um that's needed in order to kind of push it forward yes so stephanie um you have the next question but but i'll give you a minute um by just sharing you know uh in in any moment in the, in the way that i kind of uh look at things and i've i've said this in many meetings and i i think that that life really is a spiral and that we are going to hit the same point on several occasions as you go around the spot, you've got to hit the same point. But I think that what happens is we are further along, at least that's what I hope happens. So when I see this moment, I see this moment of, you know, added resources and people believing that Black Lives Matter um, and, and that voice becoming louder and then we're going to kind of go back into this recession, but we're going to be a little further along. And, and that's, that's kind of the way that I, that I live with the fact that, that um, this is a moment and you, you know, we, we may not be the flavor of the month, you know, in, in three years, 
but we we have to keep moving that needle forward and get expanding it outward. So that's me. So Stephanie, in our pre-meeting, and, and to be perfectly clear, what is it? Clear about um, the fact that we we had a, a conversation with each other and these questions actually came out of that conversation. And you spoke about the generational bridge. Uh, and that you were in the bridge generation. And what is your role as a bridge in the generation? What's your role in the arts? What's your role in organizing? And what's your role in love? Because you talk a lot about doing things in love with mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. What? should we be doing with it? What should be, what, what's the role of the bridge and how do we um, make sure that it's, you know, it's held up? <laughs> well, so I consider, I thought about being, what it means to be a bridge as, um, you know, we were going through that transition in leadership there at uh, Junebug and I, um, I had a very close relationship with John. So we were able to, to talk, like, you know, really sit down, talk, have our Monday musings. Um, and if you know John, you know, he had a lot of things <laughs> he would be musing about. But um, at the same time that that was happening, there was also this growing network of young folks that were coming, that were new, some new to New Orleans, some had been there for a while. And so I had these, like, there were two generations and different ways of doing things. I felt like I was caught in the middle mm -hmm. because on one hand, I, I feel like I probably connect more to baby boomers. I don't know why that is. I think it's because when I grew up, I was just around a bunch of, you know, my grandmother, my aunts, my, you know, as the firstborn. And so I connect more to that because there's something about it that I just, it's heart centered. It, it is, it speaks to me. It's about how we lift each other up, how we support each other. Um, it's conversations, it's pats on the back. It's that's okay, it's gonna be all right. It, there's something about that. And then there's the millennials and there's something, first of all, brilliant, brilliant fast pace everything's fast we can do this I get 10 emails with one email response and it's taking me forever to get the one email out and I have 10 emails from them right um and I know that that is necessary too right because that's also another area that we're going in the technology right mm -hmm. so sometimes I feel like I struggle with that but one of the things that I saw was there there seemed to be a gap in understanding that I felt like I was filling in. Mm, mm -hmm. So there was there was this thing that like, you know, I, I'll say the conversation, the conversation was around relationships and the importance of relationships with somebody that was there who was just like running through folks, pissing folks off, <laughs> upsetting people. And John said, they just don't understand the damage that they're doing. And so it was a great conversation we were having around relationships and that that takes time. You take time to build trust. Yes. That is, that currency, that is, that is part of the currency that we use with each other, right? It's part of the fast tracking of knowing whether or not this person is a good person to turn around and work with. It's if we put our own reputation on the line by speaking up for somebody, right? And um, I found that there was that, there was that gap that I felt like I was filling in. Also with that, it, another wise person told me that being that bridge, sometimes you have to say things multiple times, multiple ways. Um, and that also there was something that I had to find out about myself and how I move in the world that sometimes I'm not the best person, but I do know the person that is best to come in and i'm looking at sharon right now because we we wound up working together because i could recognize in myself that my energy even with a particular thing would be best suited for something else that was me outside of the studio 
and not in the artistic work in for that particular project, but her personality, who she was, what she embodied was the right person. Right. And so it takes a little bit of like knowing, knowing thyself and learning, you know, because I'm growing, I don't always know. I'm only beginning to learn these things. Um, but that, that is something that you have to do with love. I'll never forget Sharon saying, we are going to come in and we're going to hold them and we're going to love them through this process because, you know, creating work, it's also a very scary, vulnerable place to be in. And I recognize that. And so you do have to enter that with love. We have to do this work with love. We have to be in relationship with each other and love each other um, through this and our communities in which we, we, we work with. But for that, I love them. I love how they show up. I love when they come in and give me a good talking to. Now, I don't know what was going on in that corner. That just looked a hot mess. And most of the time they're right. <laughs> most of the time they are on point. It was a hot mess. <laughs> you know, so community knows so much more than we give them credit for, but they are my compass. You know, they really are my compass. They're the ones who help me to understand um, whether or not I am moving in the right direction. And what a time we had. <laughs> what a time we had and That's I feel lovely. like right and I feel like because people did that for me and I look back and I was like wow you were really a fool <laughs> you were really a mess and people just like loved me along and 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 I think I owe it to them to try to do that with others and um so those opportunities you know, are very sacred to me. And also I see now too, how it's really a circle because then we all just end up learning and growing and expanding. Uh, but anyway, what a time. Thank you. Yeah, you, you know, I'm just, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. I, I see you bobbing your head. And no, I mean, that, 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 that resonates. <laughs> that resonates so deeply with me because, again, this is how you learn how to interact with folk, and it is with love. And, you know, we've all been in situations, for me, and I'll be honest, I can't, if we're in a room and we got paid or whatever, we're sitting in a room to create some art and we're mad and we're fighting and people are cursing, it's like, why are we in this room? Like, why are we in here? There are 10 million other things to be mad about, cursing about, and, and you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, so I can't really see it. Um, to be in a room like that. But I want to say a quick story about somebody who did something that just, it resonates. Um, Reggie Gaines, who's a poet, who wrote Bringing the Nose, Bringing the Funk, um, good friend of ours, mentor. Uh, one day Reggie calls me and goes, hey man, what you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to do this. He goes, well, I'm going to be downtown at six o'clock. Be here at a quarter to six. Well, Reg, why are we, just be here. Hang up the phone. So I go down to this address and I walk in, long story short, um, Walt Disney had commissioned Reggie to write um, the book for the Harlem Globetrotters. And they had Kenny Leon was directing and Savion was doing the choreography. Like, I'm like, you know, like, wow. And Reggie's like, I want you to come sit in the audition. So he brings me in the room. It's, it's Kenny Leon sitting there and it's all the Disney people, Reggie and me. So as people are walking in the room, you know, they're introducing themselves to Kenny Leon, to Reggie, to Disney people, and me. Um, so, and periodically during the meeting, I could see the Disney people looking down the end of the table like, who the hell is that sitting over there? And I keep going, Reg, maybe I shouldn't. Reg's like, don't sit down, you sit down. So at the end of the, at the, end of the auditions, um, the Disney people finally kind of drifted over, was like, um, this was great. Reggie, da 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 who, who is this person? And Reggie goes, right, don't, you know, don't worry about it, he's with me. So, you know, and I'm, he, but he makes sure he introduces me to Kenny Leon. So when we go downstairs, I'm mm -hmm. like, Reg, why did you have me in there? I wasn't supposed to be in there. Um, he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, the reason why I invite you to come in this audition, because I wanted you to see that you did belong in that room and that there was nothing going on in that room that you did not understand. And if I would ex explain it to you, you wouldn't have got it. So do you understand what I'm saying to you? Totally got it. And it was like just random. 
that's kind of what it was. We never spoke about it again, but I never forgot that moment of him just wanting me to sit there and listen and see what was going on in the room. I was like, oh, I could, oh, I get this. You know, like, oh, and he wanted me to see that. So that type of reaching out, that type of being that transparent um, is deeply important. That's how, to me, that's how all of this and our relationships move around. That's why we're all friends to this day um, because of that. Lou, did you want to add something there or? Well, I, I just, I, uh, it resonates with me, especially building that that capital and this, these intersections of, of people. I remember the first uh, the first directing job I got at a major regional. I didn't know what a contract was sh should have in it, and August gave me one of his content contracts. Of course, he blacked out all the money, but uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, you know, he let me know that that capital that you build, Stephanie, that you understand when I hear you talking about it is just so important. It's important for audiences to build your audiences. I remember we were doing a show with, we had a, 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 a talk back after we'd done a show with blackface in it where someone blacked up on stage. And that is, um, it, that's jarring for, for, for people. I mean, it, black people especially, you know, it, 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 it's jarring. And uh, we had this talk back and I'll never forget this sister said, you know, when, and it was a little boy, it was Carlisle Brown's uh, uh, little Tommy Parker. And uh, I directed it so this boy turned around in blackface and it was just there in front of you. And this woman said that it made her cry when she saw it, the sister. She said, it broke me. And then she said, I remembered I was at Penumbra and I was in this space and I knew I was going to get through it. I knew it was going to be all right. I knew something that that pain and that shock that you sent me through, I was going to be rewarded and perhaps cleansed and taken to another place because of it. That's the stuff that you build up when people begin to trust your, your work and so forth. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Stephen, hmm? did you say something, Stephanie? Yeah, I was going to say it's important when we're sitting down and thinking about like this moment that we're in with COVID is that these are the things that when these disruptions happen, that type of currency and capital that I speak of is not the kind that can be grown after that. That is years and years of cultivation. That's mm -hmm. years and years of building trust and mm -hmm. your commitment to community. So when you don't have two nickels to rub together, that becomes the thing that allows you to remain in place. But for that, no more work for you. You wouldn't be able to survive. But that's the thing that a lot of organizations have and that's the thing that keeps them around. Yeah. Yeah. So Steven. Yes. We're kind yes. of touching on it, touching on it. So we're going to ask you the question directly. Da, 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 da. Uh, in our conversation, you talked about being, quote unquote, dangled uh, <laughs> by white institutions, <laughs> representing Black people in big rooms and knowing why you're there. So how do Black directors navigate that space? Huh. <laughs> there is... um. I think there's a, a training and a, a lesson, or just a training that you need to have before you even get in those rooms in terms of knowing who you are. Um, to me, having traveled and sat in rooms and listened to how budgets and things are, are dealt with and then not be about me, just to kind of be in the room, a fly in the wall. Um, so when we were able to get in these rooms and understanding why you're there, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, we, we, you show up at an institution, you show up at a theater, you know, white theater, and you, they bring you in, you're going to meet the board. Now, we all know why we're meeting the board and we get it. And we know exactly what this, this exchange is, what this is. Now, the board is going to try to sell their show. 
They're trying to get the board excited. The board gets a chance to hang out with an artist, say black, but whatever it is. And you have to be very fully aware of how and why you're in that room. And also what are you getting out of being in that room? So if we're going to do that for the theater, what are the theater, what is the theater doing for us? And then once you are interacting and really kind of having conversations and really kind of, if people are kind of in, intrigued by you um, and you have, you know, some board members like, well, who are you? I am just as intrigued about them. Who are you? How did you get to even be on a board? What does that even mean? These type of questions um, I ask um, and to be, to understand your craft. We have to know exactly in terms of what, if you're doing theater, what is theater? How does it move? Um, what are contracts like? What is the average? You can't go in here. I want $50,000 because you feel you're worth $50,000. Not aware that a theater ain't giving you no $50,000 or what you get paid. Like you have to understand all of that stuff. So when you're actually in the room with folks, you're able to be in the conversation or you're in there enough to know when to shut up. If you got somebody representing you, you know when to sit there and shut up and let them talk and you know how to kind of listen. The exact same way that you grew up in your neighborhood, you know, in your block or whoever you're around, when to talk and when to listen. Now, as a black director, and again, you know your stuff has to be just you have to be very well organized and very well, well prepared for the from the moment you walk in there to the moment you walk out of the building, all that stuff you know you're on on, so to speak. Um, and you have to, and when I say you know you're on on, to get freaked out, to be angry that somebody's sort of having a conversation that you kind of feel is condescending or whatever, it's like you address it and you check it, but you also understand like, all right, I'm in this, this institution, this is how it works. Yes, I'm talking to a board member who's actually sitting there telling me that she's never had a conversation with a black man before in her entire life and she's so thrilled by it. And you, you sort of sit there going, and I kind of go like, well, welcome to the black experience. You know what I mean? Like you really have to kind of engage with that. Um, but the, the, the part of feeling dangled, and it, it bothered me for a long time because I felt like you would get in, in certain rooms around certain people and you, you know, is it the dog and pony show? It, are you being the black voice or the black experience for this moment? Is your show the black show for the season? So now, not only are you directing the show, now it's your job to kind of help marketing go find um, the people of color to come in and to talk to, the, you know, it's like you doing all of that work. Um, that is not necessarily what you're hired for, but you have to understand that's going on while you're there. But also knowing that that does not distract from the work that needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, you're still bringing in the show and you have to bring that show in. But if you understand and realize like the opportunity I have to, that I've had to sit in certain rooms at certain circumstances, to be able to add something to the conversation where they don't expect the artist to talk or they don't think you even know what's going on. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. We know exactly what's going on. We know exactly what, how, how the budget in this conversation is going on and I'm totally in it. So you'll be able to kind of negotiate back and forth what you want and what you need. And for those who are up and coming, take the opportunities to ask other folks what they've done and how they do it. And again, when you have a chance to sort of be in the room to sit, listen and watch, but study your craft, study the field, know how touring works, know how producing works, just for you to understand what's going on. And when, we, when I go into those institutions, when I, my company goes into institutions, we talk to everybody. We're talking to the artistic director and I'm talking to the brother who cleans at night. You know what I mean? And we're asking, the artistic director, what do you think of rehearsal? Just like I'm asking the brother who cleans at night, what do you think about the show you're doing? Are you coming to the show? All of that stuff. I know is part of why we're there. So feeling dangled or being sort of like, and now the colored people, you know, you, you, you know there, there is a sense of that sometimes that you may feel on your body, but because we were battle tested through our community and performing at every community center, hole in the wall, um, prison, all that stuff, building all the way up to standing in front of a board of directors talking or performing or performing in front of a predominantly white institution doesn't move me. It doesn't shake me from where I'm at because I know if we've come through that. So for us, even creating work, if we don't get a chance to take it out, what we used to do, we, it was finding time to take the work out into the community, into a poetry club or whatever, just to hear it before we would let any theater people come and go, well, you need to do this. And the drama tell you to do this, do that. 
No, we went to the small little community center on the south side. There were 50 people there. They didn't even have five microphones. They had three. And we went up there and did our 15 minutes just to hear what their response was like. And you totally go like, oh, I know this part works. Yes, that works. And then we go back into the theater. So when the theater's like, oh, you know, I really feel like, nope, nope, nope. Not listening to that because we know this works. So it, it, it really is about fine tuning your craft, who you are as an artist, who you are as a person. And so, and then what you will settle for, not settle for. You, 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 can, you can walk away from a deal if it ain't right. You really, really can. You know what I mean? And you don't have to take something that you don't want to take. And then if you do take it, know what you're selling yourself for, if you're selling yourself, and what you're fighting for when you're in there, and how to fight, and how, the other, how those institutions fight, how they deal with you going back and forth. So all of that is just being sort of battle tested and being on the road and really kind of learning. And to be honest, listening, listening to you, Linda, you know, um, talk to us. And you've talked to us numerous times over the years. And not even realizing that those 15, 20 minutes, an hour is like, those are nuggets. Got it. Put it in my pocket. Talking to John O'Neill. Got it. Put it in my pocket. Talking to Plagonis um, in the Bronx and listening to Alivon and Rosalba. Got it. Put it in my pocket. My uncle, who don't know nothing about theater at all, sit there and talk to him for an hour about life and what I'm doing, got it, put it in my pocket. All of that is going on in a room in the theater when we talk as him. And you just figure out where you fit and what tone is needed when. But you want to be in those rooms to understand how this thing really works. There's those, you know, we come from here and then, and then also dealing with abundance and, and, and all those different levels of it and how you interact, treat them both the same way. So how I'm talking to a smaller institution is the same way I'm talking to them and what I'm asking for. We know each one has more money, but we're coming to it with love. It's the institution or whatever who's gonna make it go left. And then, then it gets real. Is that enough? Did I cover Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and, and, and I am struck and you can see it throughout the panel. Um, by the tremendous generosity of artists in this work. Um, you know, we tell stories for people and we tell stories, ooh, that people need to hear. And when they hear it and it's told in honesty, uh, they respond, you know? They respond, it's their story. And uh, I've seen certainly performances, <clears throat> particularly um, universes that are just so dynamic and, and so available to our community. Um, and I just, uh, you know, and, and, and Junebug and Sharon and I, I, I said to Lou, Lou's the only person on this panel I haven't worked with, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, I know this beautiful conversation could go on for hours of porch time and late nights. And uh, it is my unfortunate responsibility to move us toward closing statements okay. uh, to make sure that we get to hear from all the round table uh, before we close and, and then uh, Pangea and Arts Action will close it out. Closing statements. Closing statements. Um, Sharon, what, yes. what would you like to say as a, as a closing statement to, to this evening in this panel and the people who are sharing this panel with us? Um, I love, like I feel like I was following the universes right then. Like I was with you guys in those rooms. I was feeling that. And that sense of rigor and self-determination uh, brings me in this moment to want to say that like, learn, we really are in a way small businesses. So understand money, understand taxes, set your retirement plan up, yo. Don't wait, <laughs> do it now. Uh, become financially literate. 
um, invest in your work. I think a lot of us spend all of our money on the work, but you've got to spend some in your life and in your future as well. And then I think the question too that I wanna offer is, well, what is wealth to you? So for me, this moment, I am wealthy. I am wealthy in spirit because my I would be the only reason I know I'm alive is because the ancestors love me because I left to my own devices wouldn't be here. <laughs> People loved me. I'm wealthy. I'm wealthy. I'm healthy. You know, so like really, really, really let's be self-determining. Let's be rigorous and let's be expansive and let's rest in love. That's what I'd like to say. And thank you Eats, so much and so grateful to be here. And thank you. We're so grateful for your work and your words. So um, let's see. Hmm. Lou, final thoughts. Um, you, you talked about being sure about who you are and 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 knowing techniques and and you know those things resonate and uh, continue with what Sharon is saying. Um, what would you like to say to us? Well, I, I think Sharon's on it, all those facets of what it takes to, to exist as an artist, as a director. Steve uh, hit it perfectly, you know, with uh, uh, us, that, that you, have to, you have to hone your craft and take care of it, all that sort of thing. I, I think what I'd like any aspiring directors out there to know is that all of these people, Sharon, Stephanie, Steve, they're available to you. I'll ne it, 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 it blew my mind the first time I called up some of these people. I called up Ed Bullins. He said, hey, man, you know, and, and all of a sudden we're down, we're talking. These people are, are there because they do the work that they do because they care and they will be available to you. Don't be afraid to call them up and say, hey, I heard you on Howl Around or whatever it is and, and you said something, what did you mean by that? I got high school students reading some essay that I wrote 25, 30 years ago saying, you know, what is this? And I sit up and talk to them because I care. I want that knowledge out there. It's nothing to me. And I know, uh, I can see all y'all nodding your heads. It, it's just, they're available. Call them and ask them. Get their number, talk with them, worry them. <laughs> they'll, 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 they'll answer you. I know they will. Indeed. Indeed. Stephanie. The thing I think that is coming up for me on the inside of it is, um, I think it has to do something with uh, what Stephen said about knowing yourself, um, that it is a combination of both the skill sets that you have, but there's also something that is like mother wit, mother tongue, the things that you can't be taught, can't be taught anywhere else, is taught in your grandmother's kitchen, or it's taught in the neighborhood, it's taught on the corner, it's taught in the barbershop. This is a type of education that you cannot purchase. It's the lived experience, you know, and that lived experience, you know, no matter what any book says, <laughs> that lived experience is tried and true. And uh, sometimes that is the type of education that you're gonna need to be able to lean into as we're going through. Cause that's that little bit of something that your grandmother taught you or that your dad, my dad said always, listen more than you talk sometimes. Um, and is that skill set, you know, inside of a room, you know, people think, what well, did you go to law school or no, nope, mm -mm, my daddy, my daddy taught me how to play that one. You know, where you're negotiating, you just don't say anything. You go, hmm, hmm. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> that didn't come from school. That came from dad. And I think that that's important for us never to abandon that, to think about that as well. 
to hone your craft, to always remain open to being a student, and to never forget where you come from. And I think that is so much of what I would describe as 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 our black aesthetic, you know. Um, so, um, Stephen, you get to bring us home, brother. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, I think the, the big thing for me is it's the work, um, and when I say the rigor that is going to take to bring with the work. Now we've talked the love, all that stuff, and then there's the rigor, the work the real work that needs to be done. Um, so you're prepared for moments when they present themselves. Um, and also knowing if you're gonna be in the craft, know the craft. When I first was like, I'm gonna kind of do this, um, I would sit in the library and just kind of go through theater books just because I just needed to read them, um, just to kind of know what was going on. I learned about black theater and black theater directors just kind of picking up books and thumbing through it. Um, American Theater Magazine used to buy it every month, read it from cover to cover, just to know who the players of the game was. So when we start bouncing around the TCG or whatever, I know who's in the room um, and who I, I should be talking to. So it's really this type of black excellence of people of color excellence, what the, that type of work is gonna take that type of work. Um, the one thing I always took pride about universes was that I always say, no one's gonna outwork us or hustle us. We gonna work. Uh, we gonna do. We would do two, three shows a night, driving around New York City. We gonna work. Um, we gonna be in a room rehearsing to the theater. People go home, and then we're gonna stay an extra four hours. We gonna work. Um, so that type of work, that type of, um, because we want it, right? And so that type of work, that type of energy that it takes to reach levels that you are for yourself. So when you're in the room with other folks who are also at a level, it's it's like. Yes, I am prepared to be in this moment. I'm even prepared to have this conversation right now because of the work that I've done. So I, you know, the, the journey that we've all taken to get here, it's a beautiful thing to see because we all know it was work that got everybody in this room here. That initial spark that popped in me when I was a little kid is still sitting right there. And I'm so happy that it hasn't gone out. It has water thrown on it, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. blown in the wind a bit. You see it getting, the wick has gotten low, but you know, when I really dig deep, it's like it, that person's still there. And that's what you, you try to bring when, you, when you're working with folk um, and to the work itself. When you're alone by yourself, that, that rigor to the work. Thank you, Steve. Well, I think it is about that time. Linda, any final word from you? You know, the conversation has been so rich, you know, that uh, I, the only thing I can say is that I am grateful to be in, in the number. And, uh, you know, at the top of the show, when we talked about, I, I tried to kind of step back and, and, and not name names uh, because they were just too many, but, you know, Robbie McCauley. Oh, um, say yeah. it. All right. Yes, Robbie. Uh, you know, um, yes, Robbie. Stephen, you know, S Stephen Sapp, Jane Sapp, um, you know, um, and I, I've been thinking a lot, uh, particularly since I heard Chadwick Boseman's address to Howard, you know, graduation, and I'm a Howard grad, and um, it touched me, and I remembered all of these, you know, uh, the, the Ted Coopers and the Ron Truitts and the, you know, Linda Gravatz and the Charlie Browns and, the, you know, just people. Um, and I want to honor them and to be as good as they were at passing on um, the permission to be artist and to be fully artist. Um, and not to remove ourselves from the world, but to, to be fully a part of it in all of its struggles. Thank you, Linda. We are honored to have you here and Sharon and Lou and Steve and Stephanie. Um, thank you all for um, being with us tonight and sharing your brilliance. Um, Mina and DePunker, you wanna close us out with a few words? just want to say we are, must have done something right in our past life for this evening to occur like the way it went. 
Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, uh, Linda. Uh, so, so, so grateful. Sending you love and energy. You taught us so much, and we are so, so, so grateful. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to also say that we wouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't be able to do this without our funders. The current funders are the Mellon Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And our past funders have been First People's Fund, Sardna, and Nathan Cummings Foundation and the NEA. So thanks to everybody who supported this effort along the way. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you to everybody who came today because we couldn't have done this without all of your presence. And thank you, everyone. I am so grateful. Like, I'm leaving with so much love in my heart because of the words that were said tonight. Thank you. We just want y'all to know that this is a beginning of a conversation. Uh, and please mark your calendars now. We are going to be doing a weekend long convening in late November 19th to the 22nd, a virtual convening of all prior institute participants and cohorts. Y'all invited, y'all come. And we will be live streaming some public sessions with HowlRound. So please stay tuned. Uh, we do hope you will join us and give some love and gratitude in the chat for all the amazing um, participants this evening. And we're gonna play out with some music. We, uh, we came in with universes and we're gonna go out with DJ Cotton. Thank you HowlRound and thank y'all. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Directors Institute and the World Theater and Grandria. Thank you, Lumber. Thank you, Jumba. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jumba.
Goodbye, darling. So good to see you. You too. I love you. Thank you. Thanks, Linda.